Welcome back to another episode of Palisade Radio. This is your host, Colin Cattell. Returning on the show quite quickly after our discussion last week is Anthony Malowski. Anthony, we had on the show last week to talk about what was upcoming on LME Week. LME Week has now passed, and many of the predictions Anthony made were spot on. Anthony, thanks for coming back on the program so quickly. Colin, thanks a lot for having me. It's always uh, it's always enjoyable to catch up with you and, and the listeners. Yeah, last week you uh, made a prediction that you thought Nickel was going to be front and center at LME Week. I think it's uh, pretty amazing to make a prediction and have a commodity of that substance move up. It, it moved up 10% this week, so obviously had to be a focus there. What did you find at LME Week? Yeah, no, the, uh, it, it was a pretty pretty amazing week this week. You know, every every year you go to LME Week and and there's a theme, and, and that theme kind of changes from year to year. And this week, every single meeting that I had, every lunch I attended, every seminar had electric vehicles and you know the metals that are impacted by the adoption of the electric vehicle as a core focus. And you know clearly nickel is one of the the big the big four there being copper, nickel, cobalt, and lithium. And so nickel was a major focus in in many of these meetings. And you know I would say in particular, people were focusing on, a deficit and and you know there's talk about you know Vale has a presentation circulating in the market showing a two million metric ton deficit out in the future uh, really focused on a very specific part of the nickel market you know NPI as we've discussed previously is is not as interesting as the nickel sulfide deposits that produce a sulfate which goes directly into the chemicals industry and ultimately in the battery industry so you know, there's a lot of talk about um, about even potentially needing a new pricing mechanism for nickel, uh, changing the LME warrant. You know, people people are interested just generally in in nickel and how the adoption of the electric vehicle is going to impact the nickel market, or should I say, the uh, nickel relevant to the electric vehicle market in the next com- couple years. Anthony, how much of the interest and price movement in these commodities, lithium, cobalt, and now nickel, is focused around the actual future shifts in demand? And how much of it is uh, based around the allure, if you will, in an otherwise boring commodity market? Well, I think you really need to go, you you can't um, just sort of lump them all into a single category. You really need to go on a case by case basis. So let's just start with lithium. So, So the lithium market is extremely tight. And if you believe the 2025 consensus Wall Street, you know, kind of 8 to 12% electric vehicle penetration rate, which I think is low, you need four times more production than you have today. So that, that market is truly tight today. You know, you move on to cobalt, and once again, you have a market which is already going into def- to deficit as we speak. And so the addition of any new demand is making that market tighter, let alone once again, you know, uh, an electric vehicle penetration rate, which may exceed expectations. Nickel, nickel is not in deficit this year, but uh, there are certain, you know, subcategories of nickel, as we've discussed previously, that are coming under pressure, especially as battery chemistries are evolving and they're going towards a more nickel-centric chemistry. You know, by the way, these batteries should really be called nickel cobalt batteries, not lithium ion batteries, because, you know, these are really the core uh, materials that are making up the battery. And then you have copper, and, and copper is really interesting. We can talk about it in a minute, but you know you have a, a, a tight 2018 in copper, and, and 2019, you're looking at a market that's probably going into deficit as well. So the moves are real. The moves are um, you know not anticipating uh, electric vehicle adoption five years out, but are in fact pricing in real demand that is impacting the market today as we speak. Anthony, let's talk about copper because copper is a huge market compared to some of these, all of these other commodities that we're talking about, in fact. And copper obviously plays into the EV narrative, but it also plays in on a more infrastructure side of the EV narrative in terms of building the infrastructure out to support a world of uh, more electrification. Yes, yeah, so look, you know, copper is interesting, and um, you know, you have a situation where Grassberg peaks next year, and you know, when you look into 2019, you already start to see a market in deficit and potentially material deficit. You know, we've 
we've sort of sat here now um, and, and the OECD, you know, kind of industrial recession has been on for six years. We're seeing green shoots everywhere. You know, we're seeing India starting to wake up. So you're seeing on the one hand, really a global growth story emerge generally. And then you've got Grassberg peaking. And on top of that, you have tremendous demand from electric vehicles. Remember, the you know the copper in electric vehicles almost 200 pounds so when you start to add this up it doesn't take much for you know five six years out for you know six to ten percent of copper demand to come from electric vehicles and by the way that's not even including what the implications are for copper if if there have to be material changes made to the grid and then as is the case for all of these materials you know copper cobalt nickel and lithium you know, we haven't really discussed yet on this show, but we can at some point in the future, that the battery storage thematic around your home is going to be a huge story as well. And and that battery looks a lot like, like the battery sitting inside your Tesla, and it's going to consume the same basic materials. So copper has an incredibly bullish uh, you know, few years ahead of it. And one of the really unique things about copper, I would say, you know, each one of these metals has its own interesting point for investment, is that the funds out there that, that sit in New York and the large global financial centers have enormous liquidity. You're talking billions, tens of billions of dollars, some of these funds, individual funds. And one of the key concerns, and I think this is interesting to think about if you're a retail investor, you know, you're investing your own money from your own account. You know, you have to think about where the fund flows are going to go and what the fund flows are going to do. And and the thing about copper that is in particular different than say cobalt is that when a 10 or $20 billion fund wants to invest in the electric vehicle thematic, they're going to need to chase liquidity. And if you look at what's available to invest, you know, these funds are by and large going to be pushed into copper names. And so because the liquidity is going to chase copper, uh, it will probably push the copper names far beyond uh, any of the other metals. And, you know, at some point later in the cycle, it's too early today, but later in the cycle, you know, you may well see copper exceed uh, even the peak of the super cycle, you know, based on some of the factors that we've just discussed. So copper is incredibly exciting in the coming years, uh, as well as the other metals we've discussed. Anthony, going back to nickel, and this is a topic we've discussed on the show many times, but for new listeners, can you explain the bifurcation taking place between class one and class two nickel? Sure. It really comes down to, to, you know, to being able to actually create a nickel product that can be used in the chemical industry. So you know, nickel pig iron is low grade and, you know, it, it's dug out of the ground, for instance, it's in Indonesia and coal is burned over top of it to try it out. And it's, it's very toxic and, and it, it ultimately is not used uh, in the process which results in a battery, you know, which is chemical melted into the chemical industry. The nickel, sul the nickel sulfide deposits create a nickel sulfate, and that is ideal for actually, uh, you know, melting into, or, or depending on the form, you know, putting it into the chemicals industry. And so then the big like nickel laterite deposits out there, um, you know, are not ideal for the battery industry, and they're the most common common producers out there. Whereas nickel sulfide deposits. There are less of them out there producing, and the product that can go into the battery, uh, you know, battery industry or chemical industry, and then into the battery is constrained. And so you really have to kind of break down where the nickel is coming from, the type of nickel it is, and then ultimately what it can be used for. Now, it is possible in certain instances to convert across you know you know tier two nickel into tier one nickel but in, in in many cases the expense of doing that is enormous and and really uneconomic so it's important when you're looking at nickel investments to really think about whether or not the end product at a given um, nickel company that's currently producing or will ultimately producing is one which can be sold directly into the chemical industry and on to the battery makers we are shareholders of two companies that hold significant reserves of these nickel sulfides and our entrance into that arena, which has already been quite successful, we can credit to you for bringing them to our attention. Uh, listeners from the last interview 
had some questions in terms of Giga and Mustang Minerals, which are two companies you're invested in, and if you could give some details on why you like them so much. Sure. So when I when I look at you know, let's take nickel for example. Um, you know, I, I I think about investing in in a kind of a basket of companies, and so for me, even as a personal investor, I like to think about having you know a large cap name or multiple large cap names, uh, some mid cap names, and then you know some small cap names. And I, I like this approach because uh, you know in the small cap names you get huge leverage. You know, taking a company from twenty million to four hundred million, you know, you can make a huge amount of money, but you can also get it wrong. I mean, th- things can go wrong. Um, drill holes can miss. You know, we all know the stories, right? So, you know, but you get that optionality when you have a belief in in a thematic or a belief in a, in a material. Uh, the mid cap names, you know, they're not going to run quite as much, but they're M and A targets, and so you can do well there. And then I think you just want the beta and the large cap names. So when I think about nickel. Uh, first, we'll start at the top. You know, I like Norilsk. I think this is one of the great nickel companies out there. And I think if you're ha- having a basket of stocks, you know, you, you've got to have some Norilsk. I like Independence. Now, Independence is ramping up right now, and you know, different people have different expectations around that ramp up process. You know, personally, I think Peter's doing a great job as CEO down there, and um, I think that this is a, a great kind of mid cap stock to own. In the nickel space, you know they're going to. They're actually they are producing nickel and cobalt, which is also interesting. So you get leverage to co-products there. And then finally, when I when I think about you know my personal portfolio in particular, you know I really like owning some small cap names. And for me, you know Giga is a no-brainer, right? It's the largest or one of the largest nickel sulfide deposits in the world. So right off the bat, anytime you have the largest uh, or one of the top couple largest in the world of anything it's worth thinking about. Uh, it's in a first world jurisdiction and you know it's got a management team that are actively out there trying to advance the project. And I recently spoke with the CEO of the company and he, he was telling me that you know they're they're thinking about how they can eventually create a product that's going to be sold directly into the chemicals industry. So for me that ticks all the right boxes. It gives you hu- huge leverage to the future. Uh, you know, and, and with Mustang, not probably the same size, but equally as interesting. Uh, once again, a nickel sulfide deposit that that can eventually create a uh, you know a con that will go straight into the chemicals industry. So that's why I like to think about uh, those type of names. Anthony, I don't want to brush over enough the fact that you were adamant about the importance of LME Week, and you told me that you thought it would have major implications for nickel. Prices, once again, for nickel up 10% just during LME Week, and that's massive and why we respect your opinion so much here at Palisade. So in that vein, thank you for coming back, spending time to come and address our audience. Really appreciate having you on the show as much as we do, Anthony. Thanks a lot, Colin. Always appreciate uh, catching up. think you understand the junior mining sector and you think that the participants in the mining sector, junior mining sector, are good people and kind people, hit the bid. How violent that term could be, it actually could be quite violent. Uh, It could be a rip your face off uh, uranium rally. And the world is always going to need raw material. It's going to need copper and gold and nickel and so forth. Totally destabilized. Hey, hey, troll, did you hear what's going on in Yemen?